Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me and today's video is I think probably the most anticipated in this channel's short history. It's going to be another Napoleonic Basics one and it's on the Queen of the Battlefield, the Napoleonic French Infantry. And I think for a lot of players, and certainly I include myself in this, the uh, the more prestige units out there, the Karaziers, the Hussars, the Artillery, things like that, they're the ones that we really focus on. They're the exciting ones, they're the ones that, you know, bring home that idea of dashing a land and glory. And that's, you know, I think a large part in why people love the Napoleonic Wars, I, I think that's really good. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was the infantryman who was the uh, the person who won the battles, uh, particularly for Napoleon. I've got a quote from Colonel John Elting, who is a, a US military historian. And he said, The French cavalry swaggered, the martial clanging of its scabbards. Artillerymen strode aloof pride, was not the emperor himself also a gunner, but it was the sweaty soldats de infanterie, the gravel agitating, beetle crushing infantry who truly carried the French empire on their burdened shoulders and bayonets. And I think that really gets across that as much as we might like the cavalry and the more exciting parts of the French army, it really was the infantry that fought the battles and won the battles and were really the key part of any army of the Napoleonic periods, particularly the French army, uh, because despite the fact that their cavalry and their artillery were, were very, very good, I think it was the infantry that really, really came into their own. Now, it's quite a large topic, and I want to try and get this all out in one video, so this one's going to be quite a long one, I would imagine, and I'll divide it into a number of different areas. It's going to be a slightly more difficult to do than, say, the British or the Russian video, because I think there's going to be a lot of themes interwoven into this, and I think that's because the French infantry in particular was very much an organic... A creation it really came out of the French Revolutionary Wars and I think that's why it has such a unique character compared to the other armies of the day so what was a French infantry regiment well just to be super confusing for everyone they underwent quite a few changes starting from the revolutionary period and it comes very much out of the revolutionary idea of the levy en masse which was basically where everyone of fighting age was signed up to uh, you know, provide military uh, service if called upon. And that massively increased the size of the French army, if not quite its quality. And the reason for that was that these new recruits were very basically trained in their depots, and then they went straight to their battalion. And the idea was that they would learn from the more grizzled veterans, from the troops with more combat experience. And it's not necessarily a terrible idea, but it just means that they don't have that same base level of training that, say, a British infantryman who would be joining his battalion in the field would have. So in 1793, which uh, it was actually implemented in 1794, the revolutionary government uh, created a new structure called the Demi Brigade. Now, effectively, a Demi Brigade was a regiment. They're sort of interchangeable terms, not really. Exactly the same, but I think for the purposes of keeping it simple for this video, I think we'll use the phrases fairly interchangeably. And these demi brigades consisted of three battalions of infantry. One of those battalions, actually the second battalion, was made up of regular troops who'd, you know, been in the army since before that time, since before the Levy and Mass was enacted, I guess. And the 1st and the 3rd Battalions were known as Volunteer Battalions. Now, the people who made up those weren't actually volunteers. They were conscripted in the Levy en masse. But they were known as Volunteer Battalions. It sounds a lot better, I guess, than Conscript Battalions. And it's because of this lack of good training that we see the formation that's perhaps the most iconic for the French in the Napoleonic period begin to form. And that formation is the Colonne d'Attaque. Or, you know, so I don't massacre any more French in this video than I need to. I'll carry on calling that the column of attack. And that's basically a mass of men that moves towards the enemy and uh, drives them off. And the reason why the levy en masse directly led to this was because it requires a lot less training than you know, advancing in lines. For, I think we can look at them as being almost the opposite of the Prussians. The Prussians were super highly drilled and focused and they went in line pretty much everywhere because they could uh, and the French uh, they were the opposite that they were very un undisciplined and by that I don't mean that they you know shot their officers or you know disobeyed orders or anything but they weren't as quite rigidly drilled 
as perhaps the Prussians were. The demi-brigade structure lasted until 1803, so anyone who's studying the early battles of the Napoleonic Wars, Rivoli, Arcole, even Marengo, it can be really confusing, and it, and it confused me uh, when I started learning about the period. So I think the best, really, way that I do it is just change demi-brigade for regiment. And I, it, it, like I say, it's not exact, but I think it's near enough for you to work out kind of what's going on. So the 1803 reforms saw the number of infantry regiments uh, reduced to 90, and of those 90 regiments, 19 had four battalions, and the other 71 had three battalions. The idea there, very much like the British infantry, if you've seen my video on that, that was designed to have three battalions in the field and one as their depot battalion. For the ones with three battalions, obviously it'd just be the two and the one. So that's a line infantry. Light infantry, there were 27 regiments altogether. Three of those had four battalions, and the other 24 only had the three battalion structure. So in 1803, we've got to a point now where we've got... 117 infantry regiments, if we add the two together, most of which have got three battalions, some of which have got four. So that's sort of where we are with those reforms. And it's a particularly important year because this is the organisation that they took with them to the camps at Bologna when they were forming the uh, the army of, of Britain, the army of England. And that, for me, is when the French were really drilled to their absolute peak. There were camps that were located there on the uh, English Channel coast. And that was where a lot of training went on, a lot of exercises, of unification of training skills and equipment and it also meant that because they were having exercises at core level it meant that in the upcoming years of glory up until 1809 i guess uh, the french were really a super finely tuned instrument of war with all three branches the infantry the cavalry and the artillery being able to work in concert with each other support each other and that's really the the thing that makes the napoleonic period unique in my eyes and why we named the period after napoleon because that era of warfare was all about what i call the trifecta the three legs of the army infantry cavalry and artillery working together and the better they worked together the better the army performed and no army performed better than the French army. So when talking about the uh, the French infantry, you'll have noticed that I've kind of lumped in line and light regiments together. And that's because by the Napoleonic Wars period, and even by the Revolutionary Wars period, to be honest, they ceased having any real distinction between the two types of infantry. Uh, the French infantry, again, due to the levy en masse, had a very individualistic uh, approach to being soldiers, and I don't think it's just due to the levy on mass. I think it's, it's something that seems to be pretty much in the French character, really. Uh, and that meant that while they were not as perhaps well drilled as the Prussians, as I mentioned earlier on, or maybe as well trained or as, as the British or as well disciplined as the Austrians, what it did mean is that they were much better at operating independently than troops of any of those nations. And that really came into its own when using skirmish tactics. Now, the Leger, the light infantry regiments, they had a belief in themselves that they were better than the line. But whether that's actually true or not, I think that's open to debate. There were some very good French light infantry regiments, absolutely. But there were also some very good line infantry regiments. And both of those units could operate either in close order or as a swarm of skirmishes, as they're often called. And occasionally, if you had a three battalion formation advancing, you could have an entire battalion at the front of that column that was in skirmish formation. So the differences between light and line regiments were not perhaps as uh, large as they would be in other nations, particularly the nations where individual thought was much less uh, encouraged. So say the Austrians and the Russians would be perfect examples of that. So this brings us to uh, 1808, where Napoleon issued an imperial decree on the 18th of February, and he really set out what the infantry was going to be from then until the end of the Napoleonic period. And for the purposes of this video, it's the first seven articles that are going to be the most useful for us discussing French infantry. So rather than try and paraphrase them or put them in my own words, I may as well just read the words of the big man himself because, you know, no one can say it better than him, I guess. And I'll just have a brief comment after each of the articles, just explaining sort of what that means for us on the tabletop. Article 1 
is our regiments of infantry of the line and light infantry will in future be composed of a staff and five battalions. The first four will be designated war battalions and the fifth the depot battalion. So that's kind of what we've seen in a lot of the other nations in the Napoleonic Basics videos. Basically you've got a number of battalions that are your war battalions as they're called here or your combat battalions and then you've got a depot battalion which can recruit and train troops back at home. The French were slightly different in so much as they didn't have that much recruit training, unlike, say, the British, who train their recruits quite well. Most of it was done on the march or when you joined your parent battalion. And that's purely just to get as many soldiers as possible up at the front and able to fight against the myriad of enemies that Napoleon had. And again, just quickly going back to the camps in 1804, that's why they were so important, because it allowed those raw recruits to be fully trained before going into the 1805 campaign. So Article 2 reads, Each war battalion, commanded by a chef de battalion, having under his orders an adjutant and two regimental sergeant majors, will be composed of six companies, of which one will be grenadiers, one light infantry, and four fusiliers, all of equal strength. That means that each battalion had four centre companies, or fusilier companies as they were called here, and two flank companies, their elite companies. Now one of those was grenadiers, they would be the largest, strongest men of the battalion, and the other flank company would be the light company, and that was made up of the smallest, most agile members of battalion. Now, the light infantry regiments had exactly the same organisation as the line. Again, the six companies, two flank companies, but their flank companies had a slightly different name. Their version of the grenadiers were called the carabineers, and their version of the light infantry were called the voltigeurs. And that gives some sort of idea about what the, the light company were supposed to do. Uh, the voltigeur being the French for a volta. And there's a few stories about how that came about my favorite one is that they could vault onto the back of a saddled horse but there's other ones as well but the idea is that they were a lot more agile they would do the skirmishing even better than everyone else did that's the the basic formation of an infantry battalion so just to recap we've got a regiment consisting of five battalions four to take place in the field one is the depot each one of those War battalions, or ones in the field, consisted of six companies, which were four centre companies of fusiliers, two flank companies, one of grenadiers, or carabineers, if you're a light infantry regiment, and the other one of light infantry, or voltigeurs, if, again, you're a light infantry regiment. And these companies were all of the same size. That means that in wargaming terms, if you're using 24-man battalions, then each company consists of four figures so you'll have 16 fusiliers four grenadier company four light company if you're like me and you use 36 man battalions then you have six grenadiers six light infantry and 24 fusiliers third article is each depot battalion will consist of four companies the major will always be attached to this battalion a captain designated by the minister from three candidates selected by the colonel, will command the depot battalion under the orders of the major. He will at the same time command one of the companies. There will be in the depot an adjutant and two regimental sergeant majors. So that's the formation of the depot battalion. Not super useful to the wargamer because they weren't fighting, but if there's a campaign or maybe you're doing the defence of Paris or something like that, it might come in handy. So it's the same as everyone else, but... They don't have the flank companies, it's just the four centre fusilier companies. The fourth article gives the strengths of a company, which we won't necessarily go into here, but it ends up with saying that the strength of each regiment will be 3,970 all ranks, of which 108 will be officers, and 3,862 will be NCOs and men. So if we divide that by the number of battalions, uh, we get what our... Our basic formation is, so we're looking at around about 700 men, uh, which is why I go for 36-man battalions. That's the equivalent of one figure represents 20 men. You can do it smaller, so one figure represents 30, and that'll give you your 24-man battalions. So Article 5, which is of particular use to, um, I think, those modelers out there, or those who want to really represent the different parts of a Napoleonic battalion, has 
There will be in each war battalion four sappers, who will be chosen from the Grenadier Company, of which they will continue to form part. And there will be a corporal who will command all the sappers of the regiment. Now some of you who've seen the battle reports may have noticed that I've put my sappers in with my colour party. Uh, so that's very naughty of me. It was only uh, when researching this video that I realised that they would stay in the Grenadier Company. So I've, I've now switched to that. So now I'll have, of my six Grenadier Company figures, one of them will be a sapper. Now, if we're doing the 1 to 20, that grossly over-exaggerates the number of sappers, as there's only four. But you know what? Sapper figures are cool, so I'll, I'll add them to the Grenadier Company. And it just helps them stand out a little bit. Article 6 is, in battle, the Grenadier Company will be on the right of the battalion, and that of the light infantry on the left. Now, this is a good rule of thumb for Napoleonics, and most other periods as well, is that the area of prestige, or most prestige, was known as the right of the line. And that was because, you know, back in medieval times and earlier, the most prestigious uh, unit would go on the right of the line. And often there was a lot of fighting or internal disputes about who would have the honour of being on the right of the line. By the Napoleonic period, that's kind of dropped off, but that order of seniority is still there. So sometimes if you're unsure about something, just think who would have seniority in, say, a battalion? Will it be the Grenadier Company? Something that I often use it for is I can never remember whether the King's colour or the regimental colour in a British battalion, which way round they go, which was on the left and which is on the right. And I think, well, the King's colour is always going to be the senior one to the regimental colour. So that one goes on the right, nearest to the Grenadiers and the regimental colour goes on the left, nearest to the Light Infantry Company. So that's how I remember it. Yeah, I guess it's no easier than just remembering Grenadiers on the right, Light Infantry on the left. But if you're setting up your infantry battalion, and you know you want that level of authenticity, then that's the thing to do. If they were in attack column, the two elite companies would actually go at the back, which may have been to stop people kind of drifting out the back, stumbling over and uh, not keeping up. And even at the back, a column was two companies wide. The Grenadiers would form the right-hand side of the back of the column, and the light infantry would form the left-hand side. A little bit more um, clarity given to that column uh, formation is given by the final article I'll read about here, Article 7. When the six companies are present with the battalion, it will always march and act by divisions. When the Grenadiers and light infantry are absent from the battalion, it will always manoeuvre and march by platoon. Two companies will form a division, each company will form a platoon, each half company a section. So we won't really talk about the section here, because that's just going to confuse matters. But what we mean by act by divisions, and again this is slightly confusing, because there's another formation which is a division. So when they march by divisions, they basically mean they march two companies wide. So two wide, three deep. Uh, if you look at the screen now, you'll see a picture of a column of attack in March by divisions. And if you look at the screen now, you'll see that same battalion, but without its elite companies, we can say that they've been um, taken away and put into combined grenadier and combined light infantry battalions. Uh, very similar to the Austrians, if you've uh, seen the video on the Austrian infantry. And this one, you'll see it's one base wide, and so that shows that they're marching and manoeuvring in a column of platoons there. So a little confusing because the terms mean different things to the same words that we use in different contexts. But basically it just means that if you're on the battlefield, if you've got all six companies with your parent battalion, then have them two bases wide. And if you don't, just have them one. That can be a little bit confusing for your opponents if you're, you know, what's the difference between column of march and column of attack so you can either leave a little counter next to them with that or just like find a way of agreeing with your opponent whether you're in column of march or column of attack so now we're almost 20 minutes into the video and i want to stick by my uh assertion at the beginning that it was going to be one video i did say it was going to be quite a long one so thank you for sticking with it so far and uh we're going to move on to the next part of the video now so if you want a break or something I, I recommend now is the time to take it before we delve in to the next topic and that's going to be into the higher formations and the tactics of the French Napoleonic infantrymen because I think the two are quite closely linked so most infantry regiments would be put into divisions and this is where that confusion from earlier on comes in with the what's a division 
So a division normally consisted of two regiments, and those two regiments would have their three field battalions with them. So for most of the time, a division consisted of two regiments, totaling six battalions. That's not always the case, but that's very often the case. And where possible, one of those regiments would be line, and the other one would be light. Again, not always possible, but ideally that would be the case. Two divisions would form a brigade. So a brigade would consist of four regiments, totaling 12 battalions. And quick maths tells me that a brigade is going to be 12 times 700, around about 8,400 men. But a division would be the general tactical element that the regiments would fight in. So you're looking at between three and six battalions there. Later on in the Napoleonic Wars, some regiments got as many as six battalions, but they were often very under strength. So you're looking round about three battalions worth of figures. In black powder terms, if you were to have one of those huge regiments, you could maybe have two or three battalions of medium size and then the rest of small. But I'd just I'd rather just have three regular sized battalions. And if you collect that, then you're pretty much good to fight any French regiment from, as we've seen, 1804, realistically, up until 1815. So what formations would these French infantry battalions fight in? Well, as with all nations of the Napoleonic era, their infantry would form square if faced with cavalry. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. I am still planning on doing a video about square. They would also have line, as per pretty much everyone else, and they would have column of march. Now, their line would be very similar to all the continental powers it would be three deep with the third rank not firing but either reloading the muskets of the second rank and or stepping forward to take the place of casualties in the first two ranks now as we looked at earlier on a formation that was pretty unique to the french certainly early on in the napoleonic wars i think it was picked up by the other powers later on was the column of attack the attack column and this is also sometimes called a heavy column if it contains all three battalions, one behind the other. And basically that was a large mass of men, two companies wide, three companies deep. And they would advance towards the enemy uh, in just a, a solid block of men. It was very good for the French because it meant that you didn't need to be particularly well trained in order to do it. You were sort of swept along by everyone else in the column. And it also had a really large psychological effect when, you know, you're stood on a hill and, you know, you've got you the rest of your battalion around you, but you're looking at 700, or if all three battalions are advancing towards you, over 2,000 uh, guys all marching, bayonets glittering in the sun, shouts of vive l'empereur, and the, uh, the music playing. I, I think it had a much more psychological effect than a physical one. And that's why in most Napoleonic battles, hand-to-hand -hand combat, especially against a French column, is incredibly rare. Usually, either the column would be repulsed, or more often, certainly in the early days, the column would advance towards the enemy, and the enemy would fire a final volley, and then just break and flee before actual contact was made. The main downsides of the column of attack, though, are that you're a huge target, really good target for artillery, because a single cannonball, you can take out a dozen or more men. Whereas against, say, an Austrian line, a single cannonball can only take out three. Um, and the other main problem that you've got is you've got very limited firepower. So if you're two companies wide, then you're only firing a third of your guys. And that's if you even stop to fire. Which, to be honest, in the Napoleonic period, for the vast majority of musketry, you didn't really need to stop to fire because you were so inaccurate anyway, that it didn't really matter. They'd probably just fire on the march. Later on again, or if you've got a poorly trained unit, most of the time they'd just have the muskets held up in the air, like the classic Napoleonic miniature pose. And that was just to stop them you know, literally stabbing the guy in front of them occasionally, or firing when they didn't need to, and things like that. So the French column of attack was put in place it was almost a unique creation of the levy en masse and the need for the french doctrine of attack which you know they'd see right through to world war one um, and it meant that they were often 
a lot stronger on the attack than they were on the defence. And I think the ultimate example of this is at the Battle of Austerlitz, where the French initially occupied the Pratzen Heights, then they abandoned them. That allowed the Austrian and Russian army to occupy what was seemingly a great tactical position, but it allowed the French to attack the rather extended Austro-Russian line the next morning, and because they had that Alain, that force of attack, it meant that they were much better at doing that than they would have been defending the heights in the first place. And this comes to a key, key difference that the French had to the rest of the armies. We've talked so far in the video about how they weren't as well trained as, say, the British, how they weren't as stoic as the Russians or the Austrians, how they weren't as well drilled as the Prussians. But let's not forget, this is the army that conquered the whole of Europe, from Spain to Russia, everywhere in between they, were, they conquered. So what did they have that the other nations didn't? And it really comes to a bit of an X factor, really. It's something that's very difficult to take into account in War Games rules. And it's the esprit de corps. It's the French belief that they were capable of doing what the Emperor told them to. This belief that the French soldier had, that he was the best soldier in Europe. That he and his friends were able to do what no one else could do. It's a morale thing. It's, it's about having that faith that's very difficult to quantify i think on the tabletop and this esprit de corps was really personified almost by the eagle that the regiment carried the eagle was mounted on top of the regimental flagpole and it was made of gilded copper and unique amongst the napoleonic wars armies it was actually the eagle itself that was the regimental standard most um, battalions most regiments would have the actual flag, would be the symbol of the regiment. So, again, to go back to the British, uh, you had two. You had the King's colour and the regimental colour, and they were the actual flags. That was the important part of this. Whereas for the French, the flag was kind of just a bit of a decoration for the eagle itself. And if you're interested in seeing French eagles, the two best places I can think of for seeing them is either in Apsley House, number one London, which was the Duke of Wellington's residence. He's got about a dozen lining the walls in one of the rooms. Or the other uh, best place I've found to see an eagle is at Edinburgh Castle, and it's the one that was captured by Sergeant Hewitt at Waterloo. And when I saw it, I was actually quite choked up by it. It was quite an emotional moment because, um, you know, it, it really goes to show the symbol of heroism, both of the dragoon who captured it and of the regiment that he captured it from. It really brings home that, you know, this is a small gilded copper object that men literally fought and died over. It's, uh, it's quite a humbling thing to see. Anyway, that's, uh, that, that's way off topic. And I wanted to get back to talking about how infantry regiments, and battalions in particular, would operate as part of their division. Um, and there was, a f as well as having the column of attack, the French had another uh, unique formation for them. And this was a multi-battalion formation, and it was called La Order Mixed or mixed order, as uh, my non-killing it French will go. And that was basically designed to have the benefits of column and the benefits of line combined. And what it would be was one battalion in line, and then at each end of that line, another battalion would be in column of attack. And the idea here was that it gave you the weight of a column of attack, as well as the firepower from the line. It also helped against cavalry charges, because forming a square from column is much easier than forming a square from line. If you're in a column, it's almost turn to face your left or right, depending on where you are in the column, or turn around. Uh, whereas with a line, it's a lot more of an involved process. And this is reflected in black powder, where if you have Lord and Mixed, it means that if the enemy cavalry charge your battalions, particularly your battalions in line, you don't have to form square, you can stand and fire, and you don't count as being caught in line for the ensuing melee, which the rules from the Clash of Eagles book really, really does mean that infantry caught in line are in a severe amount of trouble against cavalry. It also means as well that the attack isn't stalled by that battalion having to form square, and you know the cavalry can then break up that assaulting formation. 
Another formation they would use, known as the heavy column, and that could be one battalion or maybe two battalions wide, and both regiments from that division would form one ginormous column, basically. And that was designed to really concentrate the weight of numbers on a specific part of the enemy line. I wanted to um, do another reading from the memoirs of a French general called General Bouillard, and he fought with the French in the peninsula. And while there's a lot in here about the British, I think it really gives an insight into what was going on in the minds of those Frenchmen who were making up their attack columns. When about a thousand yards from the English line, our soldiers got agitated and exchanged their thoughts. They hurried their march, which began to get disorderly. The silent English, with ordered arms, looked in their impassive stillness like a long red wall, an imposing spectacle which never failed to impress our young soldiers. Soon the distance shortened. Repeated shouts of Vive l'Empereur! En avant! A la bayonette! broke from us. Shakos being raised on the ends of muskets. The march became a run. The ranks lost their order. The agitation became an uproar. Many muskets were fired. The English line, still silent and immobile, with arms still at the order, even when we were within 300 yards, did not seem to notice the storm which was about to assail it. The contrast was striking. More than one of us noted uneasily that the enemy were very slow to fire, and reflected that this fire, so long withheld, would, when it came, be very unpleasant. Our ardour began to abate. The irresistible effect in action of an apparently unshaken calm even if it did not exist, opposed to dazed and noisy disorder, weighed heavily on our spirits. So we see something there of the psychological effects of being in a column of attack whilst awaiting a volley of fire from the British. And needless to say, it doesn't end well for uh, the French column there. They're eventually driven off by the British musketry. But really, it just goes to show that even despite them you know, worrying about what was just about to come down into their very near future they still manage to advance and attack, and that all comes down to that esprit de corps. So we've talked about how great the French infantry were. We've talked about their abilities, particularly after they went to the training camps in Bologna in 1804. But as the war progressed and the more experienced veteran troops began to either retire or, or began to leave the army through injury or death, I guess would be the, the ultimate reason they'd leave the army, the quality of the French infantry really did begin to drop off. And because Napoleon needed troops from wherever he could get them, there were many, many more foreign troops brought into French service. Not necessarily just in their independent regiments, although that, that did happen, but also drafted in as part of the reinforcements for French regiments. And when they got these foreign troops in, I think they very much lost that esprit de corps that they gain. It's, it's it's difficult to say, and it's difficult to quantify, I think, but there seems to me, and this is very much just my opinion, that that it's a very French thing to have, this dash of Alain. And I think and I think by diluting this, by bringing in troops who had other exceptional qualities, but different to this one, that really saw a decline in what the French infantry battalion was able to achieve and how they were able to operate. And I think this is probably at its clearest in 1812 at the Battle of Borodino, and later in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, where it was it was just massed French columns just thrown against the enemy. And, and unfortunately for the French in those times, the Russian infantry and then at Waterloo, the, the British and their allies were able to stand up to the the psychological effects of this huge advancing mass of Frenchmen and were able to fire and then counter assault and really that was the end of the success of those tactics. So I guess the final question has to be how does Black Powder deal with the French infantryman and how does it get across the ways that he's better than or worse than his continental or British counterparts and it's a funny one. I say it's a funny one because as we've discussed in this video so far, the French infantryman himself was not particularly any better than any others. In fact, he was a lot worse than some. But it was more his regimental pride and his command and control that his officers had that really set him apart. 
especially if we look at the French army of 1805 to 1809, where they had that very intensive core-level training at the camps in Bologna. So Black Powder gives the French the column of attack special rule, and that's very good. That gives them the reliable rule, which means that they always get to move once, even on a failed order, and it also increases their morale save by one. I think this is a very, very good representation of the French attack column. It means that they're constantly moving forward, which, as we saw in the reading, was something that they were very keen to keep on doing. And also, it means that the French are better in that attack position than any other nation, because they do, they you know may have a turn where they don't move at all. The French can always guarantee at least one move. The extra morale is quite nice as well. It balances out the extra hits they're going to take from the enemy getting the plus one to hit against them. And also, I think it nicely reflects that a column was quite a good assault formation because you can't actually see very much. So if you're in the 7th, 8th or ninth rank and the guys in the front rank have all been mown down, you actually can't see them. So you're going to carry on going because you don't know really what's going on. So I think overall Black Powder presents that very well. I think the rules for the order mixed are very, very good. I think they reflect the actual historical formation quite well. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the reliable extend to the line in that formation, because otherwise you lose some of the best aspects of being in column. But, you know, maybe that's done deliberately. Maybe that's the trade-off that they wanted to put in there. And if they're not given that, then perhaps they should all get the plus one for being ordered, which you also get for being in column of attack as well. So there we are. Uh, that's the end of our discussion about Napoleonic French infantry. Thank you very much for watching. It's been quite a long uh, episode, this one. So thank you for sticking with it this long. The next video I'm going to cover is going to be on Hussars and Chasseurs. Hopefully it'll be a little bit shorter than this one. That'll be out in the next couple of days. If you enjoyed the episode, then please like and think about subscribing to the channel. If you've got any friends or wargaming clubs or anything like that that you think people will be interested in this, please share it on there. It really helps the channel. I look forward to reading the comments, any positives or negatives. We've covered quite a lot here, but there's so much stuff that I had to cut out of the final video. Otherwise, we'd have been here for three hours. Thank you very much for joining me, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.